Hello. You know that saying that when you die, your cat will only wait a few moments before eating your rotting corpse? Yeah, uh, fun way to start a video. Dark as it is, it's true. Earlier in June this year, a woman in Russia suddenly dropped dead standing in her own home. She lived with 20 Mancun cats. She was a cat breeder, so of course she had that many. Big, chunky fuckers. 20 of them in one house. And now, no one to feed them. Two weeks later, her body was found by police after a co-worker called in that she didn't show up to work. They found her body rotting and being consumed by the felines. An animal rescuer on the scene said the cats were left alone on their own for two weeks. There was no food, so what else to eat? It's understandable, right? They ate what there was. It's very disturbing, sure, but it also doesn't feel like something the cats did maliciously. They did what they needed to stay alive in that situation, so they looked to the human that gave them food every day. When she's gone, she's still helping them in a way. I mean, what do you think is going to happen when you throw a bunch of sentient creatures in an enclosed space with little food, little if any sunlight, and the memories of the people that once lived before them? They use whatever the ones before them left them. Stray is a game about a cat. You live in a small concrete outcove in a rainy city, lush with vegetation and decay, but that really doesn't seem to matter to a small group of stray cats living on the outskirts. Happy, healthy, comfortable. The areas all around them are displaying huge signs of total apocalypse type scenario, like something really bad happened a long time ago. Yet the most you can think about is how nice it is to sleep under the rain, or to scratch this big tree, or to drink some water from a leaking crack in the wall. Everything is simple, except the part when you jump to a broken pipe and fall into an abyss. You're deep into this concrete monster of a structure now, alone. It's amazing how easy they get you to care about this cat here. Show them hanging out with some other cats and being cute, walk a bit, press a few buttons, fall down. In any other game, this wouldn't be very effective, but because they're cats, this actually works really great. We don't really need that much time to understand the relationships of these cats like we do actual characters. I mean, Garfield here is an actual character, but still a cat. A good cat, but as realistically characterized as a cat can be. Now in the dead city, the environment is immediately oppressive. The incredible graphics and lighting combined with the genuinely incredible score by v Nope, hold on, get the text-to-speech bot. Jan van der Kruisen. But it really gives this city life, gives the entire game life. It almost sounds 16-bit sometimes, retro yet wonderfully modern. The neon signs have a language that resemble many different ways of human speech smashed together. It's actually a written language that they seemingly created for the game, it's even used on the cover for the soundtrack. Maybe me in editing can translate some of this stuff. Either way, it's cool that they put that level of detail for a fucking cat game. This cat is smothered by the city. It feels so out of place in these massive concrete mazes, yet so at home hopping across vents and pipes and all over rooftops like it's nothing. The cameras seem to notice this too, creating paths of light and guiding you around the city. This one shot here sticks out in my brain a lot. A cry for help. These streets are long abandoned, nothing but decay. The cold color palette makes the cats stand out like a sore thumb with their orange tones and meows. You encounter corpses of robots. Lots of them. Yes, I'm going to call them corpses. Some of them are way older than others. How long has this city been rotting? You can find one still alive getting eaten by some small little creatures. They almost look just barely not enough like head crabs to avoid a lawsuit. But they run off before you can really inspect them. Until a huge horde of them finds you in the street. I really like this chase scene actually a lot. It's really cool. The achievement that's tied to it is a bitch and whoever decided to put it in the game genuinely deserves to be waterboarded for at least 30 seconds. Don't kill them, but just put their head in the water. But I love the chaos that is this scene. They grab onto your face and try to drink you, but you can meow them off and barely run fast enough away. They jump and slam into walls and physics objects. The horde really feels like something to be afraid of. Despite the fact that the game is pretty easy, it's able to create egg- Egg. Egg. It's able to create excellent tension and dread using good level design and the best soundtrack of the year. Like, like, easily the best soundtrack of the year. Making your way into the flat, it looks long, long abandoned like the city. Bottles on the counter, computers left to rot, 
Cat doesn't give a single fuck though. Ruin that carpet, baby. The animations on this creature are as close to perfect as you can get. I think it's probably the best cat in gaming. Like, yeah, this wins. But the animations work so well and look so good. The level design also works in favor of these animations and is all about thinking on your feet instead of being pointed where to go. Every environment feels massive and detailed, so much bigger than you. You'll rethink most situations because you're so small and you're like, oh yeah, I'm a cat and not a human person. While it is locked to being able to only jump to surfaces nearby, to me that makes sense. Cats don't jump up and down like video game characters, that would look weird. To me, it feels great and never really gets old. I am a sucker for good animations and sound design. I mean, what do you want from me? Listen to the ping of the cat claws when it jumps off of a me this metal surface here. Or the soft pitter-patter of the paws on different surfaces, like this apartment. Which is occupied by a strange force in the computer that's been guiding you this whole time since those signs back earlier in the city. It asks you to find a body for them. You respond like any Discord user, and then the door opens, allowing you to grab this little robo-buddy off of a shelf labeled B12. B12 is actually named after the studio that they created the game, which is kind of cool, Blue 12. Putting them into a machine, they appear to download into this little robot before speaking to you. This is B12. They are a little robot with some amnesia. But most importantly, they are your companion, translator, and inventory. Basically, without this little buddy, you would just be a normal cat and probably wouldn't stand a chance against the threats and puzzles of this city. Luckily, they're willing to help. They can't remember much, but they can remember that they want to get outside thanks to a postcard and a mural. Humans are long dead, but the robots down here appear to have lived on long after. I heard SkillUp use the term post-cyberpunk, and I couldn't think of a better way to describe the sort of stuff it plays with here. According to the game, humans died out some hundreds or thousands or millions of years ago. It's never really made explicitly clear. The robots have been down here for a long time locked away. So B12 wants to help the people see the sun again and do a good thing for the ones that remain in the city. And you just want to go back to laying in the sun and scratching wood. So our quest begins! The adventure of this robot going on a journey of self-discovery and common good to maybe find hope in this dying world. And also this cat is the main character. But I actually really like what this dynamic what does for the world building. Why is this city down here? How did it get like this? This little robot allows the language gap that once kept this cat in the dark to close. Now you can understand this world, more than just wander through it indifferent to its struggle. They are your translator for this world, not just for the player, but for the cat too. But with that comes an understanding that is deeply saddening. Only a cat is left to witness the remainder of what humanity left behind. Ironic, considering this breed of cat was probably bred by humans. Alright, this might seem a little out of place, but I am going to put a spoiler warning here. If you're at all interested from what I described about this game, then please go play it for yourself and come back. It is really good, and it's a lot more of an experience than a kind of game you can just describe and get the same feelings about. It's a, it's a, it's a real vibe game, you know? You gotta go, you gotta go play it yourself. Also, uh, yeah, subscribe while you're here. Uh, <laughs> you've been tricked! <laughs> After a brief trek through the city once again, now with B12 in tow, you encounter your first living robot. They appear very startled by you, probably because you're roughly the same color and shape as the life-draining Zerks, and most of the people in the slums have never even seen a cat. Oh, fuck. Let alone any other animal. You confront their guardian. They seem to be prepared to defend. With this dude's big spear, it's implied that they have some sort of system that's keep kept them alive for this long with the Zerks around. Honestly, I think he's bluffing. I haven't seen this guy do anything other than stand there and pretend that everything isn't going to shit. Look at him. Just look at, look at him. He's not okay. But these bots can help you get to the outside. The robots in this game are really interesting, referred to as the companions by B12. They used to once be cleaning robots, set to basic monotonous tasks that humans were too bored and kind of pretentious to do themselves. But eventually, after the humans were gone, they slowly kind of changed. The robots eventually forced into this massive bowl of a city, walled in for so-called safety, began to imitate the humans. After they all died off, these bots started mimicking their behavior. We take care of the plants because they look nice. The humans took such good care of them, so we should too. It's what they would have wanted. 
They kept humanity alive within themselves and sort of became us. They're, they're good robots. I also want to take the time now to express how genuinely fantastic the animations are in this game. I talked about the cat already, it's amazing of course, very expressive and fun visually despite just being a cat, but these robots, oh fuck! These robots are uncanny in the best way. They talk in a language that's all their own, robotic noises and beeps, but translated it almost resembles human speech. However, their animations are fantastic and super realistic looking. Like, look at how this scene I showed earlier, for instance. The way this guy backs up a little bit, very caught off guard before slamming his whole body into the button on the wall and then running the other way. It's also natural and lifelike. It's actually a more convincing cyberpunk environment than Cyberpunk 2077. Just one more. The way Momo walks into this guy looking at them and non-verbally apologizing, then sitting on the seat and pushes the chair forward for you. Or the way this guy reacts to you jumping up onto his chest. It's all so good. These animators should seriously be proud. Speaking of robots, this is the slums, the first of three semi-open world areas that act as a break between the constant uh, running for your life and delivering stuff. Funnily enough, these are usually my favorite parts of the game, moving definitely a bit slower with a lot more dialogue and exploration and backtracking to give people items and finding collectibles, but it's actually very relaxing. And these environments are so beautifully realized that I don't really mind wandering through them aimlessly. They truly feel like they're lived-in spaces, as cliche as that is to say. The sharp neon lights, the realism combined with this sort of cyber trash aesthetic. There's loads of collectible memories that make for some great world building here. I love the slums. These robots and some humans were left down here after the rich humans moved up to Midtown. When Midtown started throwing their trash down here, the humans needed some way to get rid of it. So they doused the slums in a harsh chemical. One that eventually ate through everything and anything. But long after the humans were gone, that stuff didn't just go away. It mutated and eventually got a taste for more than just trash. They got a taste for metal and for kitty cats becoming the Zerks. Uh, nice job, humans. You really did a good job. Now the robots, immortal, bored, and with plenty of time on their hands, slowly started to imitate the humans, as I said earlier, basically coming into sentience a little before the Zerks sp spawned into existence. Anyway, now in the slums, you can begin to contact the Outsiders, a group dedicated to getting to the surface at any cost, despite most believing it's just a barren wasteland. You can find Momo, drunk off oil and wallowing in their own sadness. All his friends left to go to the outside, and he hasn't heard from them since. So, now you, being the absolute cat that you are, need to get them off their robo-butt and motivate them to help find their friends and open the gates. And, uh, do everything for everyone, really. This part of the game is great, forcing you to use the environment to navigate and find these four books that you need to progress. They do this a few times, but I still think this one is the best, maybe on par with Midtown later. The, these apartments are really cute, too. A small piece of these characters we will eventually meet. Doc, Clementine, and, uh, fucking, uh, Zablatzor, Zablitzo, Zabaltimore, Zabfucking Bitsabob, Zablatzbar, Zabaltazar. Yeah, that's it. He's the weird one that sits in his hut and does fucking robo-acid. I do love him, though. He probably smokes robo-weed. After a lot of shenanigans in the slums, turning on the radio tower and reuniting his a son with his scientist father, you can eventually leave into the sewers, where you can go find the biggest McGee. The sewers is a great section. You're now equipped with a UV light that you can use against the Zerks, which really gives you an edge in this area. We really get to see the extent at which the Zerks evolved in the time since humans, too. We can find massive beating eyes on the wall. The walls themselves even pulse with deep red flesh. Egg sacs and fully drained robots all over the place. The game implies that it's one big hive mind through one of the memories really makes you question how different the Zerks are from robots. They're just trying to live in a new way like the robots did imitating the humans, but in this case, it's a bacteria that wants to eat any anything and everything. These guys are ruthless, and eventually get the drop on you and B12, causing them to overload themselves. B12 is down, and remember, without this robot, this cat is just a cat. So in a lovely little moment, the cat grabs B12 and sprints forward, trying to escape the massive horde of creatures. Another awesome chase sequence. After getting out of this zone, you're barely home free, finally reaching a small vertical town right before Midtown. Basically the small town right before you get to downtown that sells shitty t-shirts and where you can do drugs that aren't legal in the big city. Like Mahjong! Here we can find some small quests and some beautiful scenery. These bots couldn't make the full trip to Midtown or chose to live here. 
Some of them were apparently taught here in school as well. They have small classrooms set up and some bots talk about Aunt Clementine. Maybe she taught them stuff. That's really sweet. You can also find Beelzebub at the top. Zabalthazar is actually pretty interesting. He's basically hooked into a full computer set he can use to communicate with people. Essentially, a sentient radio. He tells you that you need to get in contact with Clementine, the same Aunt Clementine from earlier, in Midtown. She can help you get closer to the city's exit. Climbing the tower and heading into the city proper, we enter the most beautiful section of the game. Midtown is fucking gorgeous. Arriving there the first time, I was just in complete awe. The small cat is completely swamped in the bright neon lights. Robots wandering the streets and working in shops. They wear fluffy coats to look cool and get arrested by sentinels, the law enforcement of this city. They've kept some things in order, but as the robots get more and more sentient, the sentinels start to seem more and more immoral. Eventually, they all fear them, go hush-hush when one walks by. This is the core of the entire city. While the slums drowned in poor waste management, this area was crushed under government control. This is basically the last big area before the end of the game, and I also love that they waited so long to bring us here, as well as having it be back-to-back -back with the ant village. Somehow, as you get further and further into the city, the cat starts to feel more and more alienated, yet always so comfortable. Walking the alleys and streets in this way makes me realize how cats adapt so well to any environment. Even after their house cat origins are long dead, they still echo what the humans taught them. The bright neon lights smother this little creature in the massive city. It's an image that speaks. These robots act rebellious. They pretend to eat and drink and party. They live just as much as we did. So how different is it really? Back in the tower with the Zobaltazar, you spot a container like the one you saw back in the flat. B12 finally remembers. The scientists they've been talking about this whole time, unable to remember their name, it was them. What's specifically interesting is that they say they miss them. Time and time again, they refer to the scientist as someone in the past tense. They talk about how they miss him. This scientist may have survived the plague, but they aren't really human anymore. He lived with his family, watched as the upper floors dumped chemicals on them. He watched his family die, then in a moment of desperation tried to upload himself into a robot. But this shell we see here was broken, ending up in the city's power grid instead. He was once someone who might have created some of these robots. Maybe his work had an influence on why they're so human now. Or maybe they were just another desperate person trying to survive. But they're long gone. And now they're B12. But hey, it could be worse. At least they've got a cool cat friend with some chance of fixing this. We end up doing some more backtracking here, and also some Metal Gear-style sneaking, avoiding Sentinels and help Clem get closer to the outside. Clementine is a cool character. She hides in her apartment mostly, but she gathers information and uses her contacts to find ways to the outside. She's resourceful and clever and wanted. So you gotta help her! You spend the next while running around finding memories, exploring downtown. You can talk to the weird people around, do some secret hunting for these cute little badges, and just generally soak in the atmosphere. Unless you're speedrunning, of course. These environments are so packed with little details, though, and secrets. So many little perfectly crafted bits and bobs that really make the whole place feel lived in. Or completely deserted. I seriously think that the movement in combination with the level design and visuals deserves some kind of award. The gameplay overall reminds me of a 3D platformer combined with an old point-and-click adventure game, but modernized and simplified in a way that makes it really easy to understand, which is I don't think is a bad thing for a narrative adventure game like this. After helping Clem's client get into the nearby Neko factory, you can do some very sneaky sneaking to find the battery you need to power the train to escape. This Neko factory is actually interesting. While it is a fun pun and also a pretty decent stealth section, I don't really know why they even need the robots working here. I don't think they really know either. Except for the omnipresent, completely non-sentient algorithms running the city. They aren't really doing anything here that is actually helping anyone. The worker bots are held hostage here and if they don't work, well they get turned into soulless droids or thrown in robot prison. The sentinels say they're getting rid of the trash but maybe this is how they just dispose of it in the slums. Lie to people there and then drop it in the lower levels. It seems the bots took on all the human and inhuman traits that we left behind. 
After gathering some items and exploring for a while, you'll eventually end up at the nightclub, where this dirty little dude bomber jacket is about to cross you and giving you the sentinels. I really like his simple argument of I value money over companionship. It's not totally void of emotion, he clearly enjoys it somewhat, but it's interesting to see it phrased so logically from a robot that is now sentient. Not too far off from humanity, honestly. I will say this double cross kind of comes out of nowhere. It's not as much of a betrayal as it's just like, oh, you're evil? Okay. As Blazer really never gets enough time to shine as his own character that you get attached to, he's a means to an end. And he also doesn't really gain anything from helping you steal the battery, so why did he wait until now? You got the battery anyway. What, did you just want to bathe in the suspense of being the bad guy? I mean, he doesn't even use his real name. But either way, you were sold out. Now you've been arrested for committing the feline felony of stealing a nuclear car battery. You now need to escape using nothing but your cat skills, as B12 has also been captured and you've lost your stylish backpack. Cat going to jail is honestly not something I expected from this game, but the jail level is actually a really great return to the beginning where you're separated from B12, reminding you of how disconnected you really are from the place you're attempting to save. I really like the way this level goes. You no longer have your translator friends, so when you meet Clementine again, you can't understand them. It's the perfectly recreated dynamic of a human and a cat, history repeating itself. Something I've heard a lot about this game is, wow, this is one smart cat. Well, cats are actually pretty smart. Cats may not understand words, a lot of animals can't actually understand language, all they hear when you speak is just a jumble of noises and sounds they can't make out, much like these robots when you don't have them translated. It's never that they couldn't, it's just that they were never able to empathize because of the language barrier. I'm not saying it makes perfect sense that this cat can do adventure game fetch quests, but I do think there is some genuine meaning to the way this cat learns to understand these robots with the help of a translator. You can't understand what Clem is saying, but you know her, and you want to help her. She points at some keys in the other room, and off you go. As crazy as it is, it doesn't feel too far off from at least what this cat has been understanding from their time with B12. This is what they've been doing the whole time, going to places, getting a thing, and bringing it to someone. Who's to say they didn't learn something? Unlocking Clem's cell, you can make your way further into the prison. We get some more non-verbal storytelling when our cat is upset that they caged our friend. Cat wants friend back! Clem looks at you, and nods, before you both head downstairs to free them. Sneaking past some of the sentinels, you can disable the security systems, nab B12, and run back to Clem. B12 is once again thankful. Uh, with our crew reunited, you can now once again become the cat hacker that you are always destined to be. This prison environment is fucking ruthless. Robots are stripped of all their meaningful clothing, forced to sit in yards or cells that feel awful. Or if they misbehave, they'll be wiped, parts of their files deleted. They either end up dead or not who they were before. You can find bots locked in chairs, looking in a lot of pain. There's dialogue about how they're kept here for thousands of years, unable to die. I don't think I need to explain the implications of that. But you're able to help the remaining bots in the yard and Clem as you make your way to your escape. Getting to a large room and jumping on Clem's hat to progress and also getting her to commit B and E for you. You can get to a vehicle and make your grand escape. The Sentinels close behind, Clem races through the streets of Midtown all the way back to the subway we started in. She stops and closes the gate in front of you, saying she will distract them while you get outside. She says that you're one of them now. Only one of us needs to get to the outside. Bring us the sky, little outsider. And then she drives off, pursued by the sentinels. You were the truest outsider of them all, growing up inside the wall just shy of the outdoors. Now escaping is much bigger than just you going home to your cat pals. It's about freeing these robots. It's about giving these newly sentient life forms a chance to take control of their own existence instead of being dictated by mutants and soulless droids that kept a constant eye on the populace for a reason that doesn't really matter anymore. So, it's time to open that door. Entering the control center, it's perfectly pristine. Everything before is either bathed in natural light or neon shades, or completely dead. This is somehow the worst of it all. Perfectly clean and livable, yet lifeless. There are some nearby companions, but all they do is clean. Their movements are extremely robotic and lifeless. They talk basic customer service computer language, barely even aware you're a cat. They just refer to you as citizen of Walled City 99, the safest city in the world. They're all numbered, 
worker 25, worker 034, worker 236, worker 645. All the previous bots had names. Every single one was named and seemed to have something about them that made them unique. These ones are empty. They didn't get the chance to evolve like the ones downstairs did. They never experienced the trash dumps or the zerks or the sentinels. They didn't have anything other than the cold white marble of this room. Entering the next area, B-12 finally remembers everything. Humanity, swept by a plague or nuclear war, something, drove us to build cities, walled off from the outside, controlled. They made companion bots to help run the place and to keep everything tidy and efficient. The plague found its way in anyway. Maybe a stray infected animal got in like we did. The humans began to die off. The companions could do nothing but watch as the one that, ones that created them rotted and withered away. One lone scientist tries to save themselves by downloading into a robot body, but it didn't go as planned. The robots are left with the city to inherit, and a lot to think about. Thousands of years later, through some sort of unspecified event, maybe all at once, maybe slowly over time, the companions woke up. They missed the humans. They wondered where they went. They created language and culture and housing using what the humans left behind. They imitated the language and behaviors of the humans that created them a long, long time ago out of some form of respect. Or maybe some directive that eventually mutated into emotion. They copied us, became us after we died, made shops and settlements, told stories and weep the dead, created art, first copies of things humans made, then something entirely their own. They drink and party and mess up and argue. They love and listen and betray. They get tattoos and decorate and create. They hope for a better future and do everything in the pow their power to change things even a little. It's beautiful and wonderful. They're good robots. You can see that in the environment. There's a deep sadness and even mourning for the humans. Their long abandoned belongings tell a sad story. The companions refer to us as their squishy ancestors. They couldn't bear to let our legacy die with us, even after all we did to them. It's really sweet. We've all heard the tale of robots taking over the world and snubbing humanity out, but I've never seen such a quiet, empathetic take on the concept. They didn't kill us, they mourned us. They kept what we started going just because they loved us, because in some way, much like a child, they became their parents. They became sentient. Much like the cat you play as. Much like the hive mind of Zerks living around the cities. Much like B12. And I think that's really sweet. I rarely see such an empathetic and nice portrayal of sci-fi sci concepts like this. It's been done before, of course, but usually with a tone of cynicism and bitterness. I'm looking at you, cyberpunk! But this game manages to touch on similar subjects while not making you feel totally hollow. It can get better. You can see the entire city from the top of the wall here. Everywhere. From the slums to Midtown to the jail. It's also really cool to realize that ever since you fell at the beginning, you've been slowly rising. Sort of like the opposite of inside. You've been ascending. This entire journey was one of ascent and rebirth. For the bots, for you, for the legacy of the human race, for B12. You went from one side of the city all the way up and around to this wall. It's pretty cool to see from this window, especially because there's only a few visible loading screens, so the journey is pretty seamless. But now, we gotta end this. B12 is a little weird as you begin the process of opening the door. They seem restrained, more than usual. It becomes clear why, after you hack one of the three computers, it's a lot for their small shell, but they do it anyway. After one huge shock, you have to help them make the final leg. They float up much like they did when you first met them, saying how they thank you for helping them. That they see hope in the companions, in what they do. How their empathy radiates hope and humanity. B12 wanted to hold on to the memories of the past, but they're long gone. So why should they stick around to hold them back? Using the last of their power to connect to the network again, they flicker out of life as the door begins to open. The cat, for the first time, showing some sort of understanding as the shell fades. The cat snuggles up next to it. Maybe not sad, 
but understanding that something was lost. For it to understand that this bot was a friend, that this little thing that talked and flew around was not just a flying thing to it, but a companion. Maybe this cat is more aware than we think. Or maybe humans made them way dumber. We can see the remaining robots in the city. Momo, the Zerks exploding from the sunlight, and Clem, cornered by the Sentinels. When they suddenly shut off, either turned off by B12 in the system, or more likely disabled after the sun hit them, as they were only supposed to be active when the city is closed. It's been in lockdown ever since the plague hit, but everyone's long gone now, so I think it's fair we open the gates. In one last sequence, we play as the cat, now alone, walking to the exit, walking up the stairs and into the warm sun. At peace for just a moment, happy, we did it. Now they can go find their cat buddies, or maybe explore something else, who knows. But they're free to make that choice now. Before, neither the robots nor the cat could choose, but the gates are open. Everyone can begin to retake the world and shape it our own way.